just going to start this up. Um, can you folks uh, remotely um, see see my uh, screen here? I'm going to switch over to uh, to the slideshow. Can you hear me at all? Hello. Can anyone hear me? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. 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 Hi. Uh, can, uh, can I book a time to discuss about the course? Project? Yes, uh, you can book a time this afternoon um, after after class. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to be talking with a couple couple people, but you can meet us too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, today uh, we're going to be finishing up. Um, discussion of system dynamics and uh, with a bit of luck we'll start on the Asian base today. It uh, depends how, how quickly I can get through this material. Um, so uh, who can remind me what we talked about last time? Hopefully, um, well, well first order delays exhibit a memoryless property. Um, hopefully the class doesn't. <laughs> so, so uh, does anyone remember what we talked about last time? SIR models. SIR models. Okay, so susceptible to active recovered models. Um, so we had this thing called a Kermick McKendrick model, which divided the population into susceptible, infectious, recovered. Like system dynamics models in general, populations <coughs> at an aggregate level, here we're characterizing the population into different categories according to the state that they're in or the properties that they have. This will be quite different from what we see later, hopefully this class, in any case, no later the next time, uh, in an H-based model where we are dividing up the population, organizing it as it were in the model according to individuals, and for each individual recording the state that they're in. So here, the you can think of it as the organization is according to this, their, the state that they're in, the status that they're in, the properties that they have. For example, we might have susceptible male, susceptible female, infectious male, infectious female, a recovered male, um, uh, or removed male, removed female. And um, we're delineating those, we're organizing the model according to those characteristics, the state and the properties. And then the data that we're keeping track of for each of those categories is what? It's a, if we froze time in the model, what would that data be that we'd have to store away? It would be the count of people in each of those states. The contents of the stocks. Good, good. Um, by contrast, in an agent-based model, what we're going to see is that we organize the population according to individual and the data we keep track of associated with each of those units of organization, each of those people, for example, is their state and their properties. It's quite, quite different mode of organization, but we're dealing here with organization of a population by, um, by category, compartmental models. So susceptible, infectious, or recovered. So the basic model structure, we had something like this. Susceptibles, infectives, and recovered. And we can elaborate this in all sorts of ways. But this is a caricature of a lot of situations. And it captures some basic underlying truths. 
Now, thus far, we've had immigration set to zero. We're going to look at the implication of changing that, and by extension, changing whether we have births and deaths. But here we have susceptible infected recovered, and we have uh, processes <coughs> associated with infection, as shown by the incidence transition, and recovery, as shown by the recovery transition. This transition is a first order delay. This transition is driven by this nonlinear function in ways so we'll discuss. So we talked about how this could be mapped to differential equations, and we noted that a given flow within the model, say this incidence flow, will appear within the set of ordinary differential equations, also called state equations, um, in, in two places. Um, one for the outflow, one for the, um, the representing the inflow. And we had set some parameters here, which I, I provide here uh, more for people's illustration. All of these slides are just reviews of what we did last time. And in fact, the slides from later this lecture, you'll find in that same group that I posted last time on the wiki. So you can go there if you want to review them during this. Okay, um, so we talked about some key parameters. I, not I noted this parameter C, which denoted what? Contacts per unit ton, number of contacts per unit ton that each person in the population has. Each susceptible ha is assumed to have that on average and each infected on average. It's an, it's an average, but we use that as representative for the population. There's going to be a big difference from agent-based models there in the sense that with agent-based models, when we start to get into examples, we're going to see just how much the behavior of the system as a whole differs from if we were just using typical agents. It may be that the tail wags the dog, that the, the individuals, the few individuals with unusual characteristics end up determining most of the behavior. But here, in the world of, of uh, compartmental modeling, we're dealing with averages, we're dealing with a mean field characterization, and we're dealing with average contacts per susceptible or per other individual per unit time. Um, Secondly, we have beta. What was beta? Per contact between a susceptible and an infected. Right? It requires two to tango. You have to have both a susceptible and an infected. Right? Um, and then we had some common terms that we, uh, we built up. And these were these were leading up to the key term, the key term that may otherwise seem mysterious that we see within these models. So we reflected on the fact that I over N is just a fraction of the population that's infected, N here being, for example, S plus I plus R. In this case, if there's zero immigration set to zero, it's a constant. We might just indicate it as N. And then C times I over N what does that represent intuitively, this, this term here? What does that represent? If we consider a susceptible who has, what is C? That's the number of contacts they have per, say, per day with anyone. And what is C times I over N? It's an approximation for what? The number of contacts they have with infected people per day. We're kind of assuming, okay, 50% of the population is infected in total. And if, they, if that susceptible has, say, 100 contacts per day with people, say, for transmission of an inf of, of a airborne illness, then on average they have contacts with 50 people per day on average who are infectious. Right? And then we argue that C times I over N times beta is an approximation for the probability, we consider beta the probability a given contact yields transmission. C times I over N times beta is a, is a pretty good approximation when beta is small to the probability that any one of those C times I over N contacts between themselves and an infective will transmit infection. Right? And, and based on that, we, we built up um, this model here. So we, we see that key key um, formula as, as indicating C times I over N times beta as the chance per unit time that a given what will get what? A given susceptible will get, in 
infected. And hence, to figure out the number that are going from here to here, going uh, the, the rate of incidence of people per unit time, we multiply it times <coughs> x, and that will give an average number of people who are going from susceptible to infected, right? Remember that? Okay. Um, so, uh, I, I should note that we also discussed how we can rephrase this in this sort of way. So this uh, becomes I times C times S over N times beta. And this highlights the fact that the number of susceptibles, or the fraction of susceptibles within the population, is really, really important for shaping the, uh, the course of infection. Why is that? Can anyone give me some intuition why? If I'm an infected, why is it important how many susceptibles there are in the population in terms of how effectively I transmit infection or how efficiently I transmit infection? Why is it that the number of susceptibles out there matters? Yeah, because if I'm going to transmit infection, it's going to be to a susceptible. So the more and more susceptibles there are around me, in other words, the larger and larger the fraction of the total population is susceptible, the more efficient I'm going to be. I might infect several people. By contrast, if there's very few susceptibles around me, then I'm going to have to meet more and more people to transmit that infection even once, right? Probably not going to transmit to many people. So this really throttles the transmission of infection. So as the number of susceptibles falls, infection transmission efficiency is going to become smaller and smaller. In other words, there's less fuel for the fire, you could think, to catch. There's, there's less and less, there's more and more work each infective has to do to transmit, and they're going to be infecting fewer and fewer people. So, so this, this quantity here, the fraction of susceptible, is a key quantity. And it's key in a simple example, and it's key in design of programs like vaccination programs. Where the goal is to move people from a susceptible state, on the one hand, to a state where um, they are protected. And therefore, you're surrounding, you have this buffer around each infective, which has fewer and fewer people. And therefore, less and less risk, they'll be passing it on in a way that will even infect one person, much less two, or start an outbreak. Okay, so this is the sort of dynamics we saw. Um, here's a little quiz for you, pop quiz. So what is each line here? Figure out each line. What is the blue line? Susceptible. It starts with, with all the people in the population that comes down. Does it go to zero? Not necessarily, because at some point infection transmission becomes so inefficient that the infection doesn't really spread and essentially dies out within that population. There's some residual folks who have survived this outbreak. Okay, speaking of outbreaks, what is red? Infectives, and what is R? Sorry, what is black? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I could have asked for, for uh, the color associated with it. Okay, so, so I informally alluded to this yesterday. Um, initially, I should really integrate these with, with the diagram better, and I'll, I'll work through that. But initially, each infective is highly efficient. Basically, S divided by N is close to 1, so they're infecting uh, per unit time C times beta people. Right? They're, they're having a contact with C people per unit time, and for each person they have a chance of beta. So roughly speaking, it's, it's C times beta people uh, per unit time that they're infecting. That's a really high rate of infection in some cases. Um, and the rate of recovery is here is zero. Why initially is the rate of recovery zero or close to it? No order to recover. Essentially, everyone's susceptible. In this. Okay, there's maybe one infected, but it's, it's very, very small. Okay, so that's the initial state here. This, this one infective who starts out is really, really efficient. And what gets rolling there? Why is this shooting up so quickly? Why is this rising so quickly here, this number of infectives? 
Yeah, the more infectives you have, the more infectives you generate, all other things being equal. So the number of infectives grows, grows really quickly. One infects two, infects four, infects eight, etc. And the number of susceptibles has started to decline. It's started to come down, but it's still not to the point where it's really cutting into that process, right? So each infective is still surrounded overwhelmingly by susceptibles. So they're very efficient at transmitting. However, over time, what happens then? Why does this plateau out appear? Why does it start to plateau? Why doesn't it just go up? Why doesn't this go up without limit? <coughs> yeah, yeah. There's only so many people that can get infected in the first place, so it can't go up arbitrarily. And second of all, as the number of susceptibles comes down, why is that going to be important? I just, I just, we just went through that about two minutes ago. Why is it important the number of susceptibles is dropping here? Because no longer am I, as an effective, no longer is it going 1 to 2 to 4 to 6, to, or, me, 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, 16 to 32. Instead, it starts to go up more slowly because yeah, you're not contacting susceptible. So half the people <coughs> you contact are, you can't even infect. And so if that's the case, you're going to infect half the number of people you would otherwise, right? If you're surrounded by mostly people you can't infect, you're going to only infect half of them. So that starts to really cut into this. But that's not the only thing. So that's one reason it would rise more slowly. But why is it stopping? Why is it plateauing out? Why is it, why is it going flat at the very top of that? Yes, good. Because this is a stock. And the only reason the stock is going to be in stasis, is going to be flat like that over time, is if what? Inflow equals outflow. What's the inflow here to the stock of infectants? It's New incident cases, new cases of infection associated with that, and the outflow is recoveries. So, so not only is the number of infections per unit ton dropping, but also the number of recoveries is picking up. Where are those recoveries coming from? Well, they're coming because now we have quite a few infectives, right? So this starts to, to plateau out, and then I argued, came this big decline. Does this decline remind you of anything? Just in its sort of shape down for this portion of it, of the red, say from time 70 onward. Does that, does that look like anything that we've seen before, the sort of fast decay and then slow decay? What does that remind you of? <coughs> Sorry? So like a first order delay. And that's associated with a, a feedback associated with a, a, uh, a stock that's decaying out of an outflow. And that first order delay, what is this, what stock is this draining here in that way? It's draining the number of infectives, right? And do you see a first order delay within this system here? Is there a first order delay here? I spy my little eye, a first order delay. Where is it? Yeah, it's right here. It's right here, folks. I mean, here's the, here's the delay behind that. So what's going on here is by and large that, first of all, we have the inflow going way down because, well, the number of infectives is dropping. So there's fewer people to infect others, and the number of susceptibles is dropping. So they're less and less efficient in infecting others, those few that remain. And so the number of the inflow is dropping really quick here, the number of new infections. But the outflow is still draining it. The number of infected people is still draining out with this outflow. And so it drains down basically to zero. And the infection peters out. The epidemic is over. And these lucky susceptibles here have survived it. 
this is just sort of draining away the, the number of infectives. And if you look at charts from the pandemic from a few years back, the flu pandemic, you'll notice that across the nation, the charts of the number of infectives for city after city exhibit the same behavior. They all decay at a similar rate. And I've heard public health officials muse about that. Well, isn't that most curious that those are declining at kind of the same rate? I wonder if that's some aspect of the vaccination campaign or something. No, it's just, just the time associated with recovery and, um, and it's reflecting the fact that there's, there's few, uh, few infections here. So, so not to be missed here is there's a key tipping point where the number of infectives plateaus. And we argued that here the rate of infections equals the rate of recoveries. What we're going to get to here at the individual level is that there's an individual level story too. And the individual level story here is that if I get infected, ladies and gentlemen, and then I recover, the world will have more infectives after I recover if I infect more than just my replacement, right? So if I, on average, infect two people, by the time I recover, sure, I've, I've recovered, so it's one less, but I've had a net of one person, right? If I just replace my replacement, just infect my replacement, excuse me, so if all I do is infect one person and I recover, there's a net change of zero, right? And that's also what's occurring here. Here, each infective is, is infecting one, one person. They've got one person they're infecting. Here, ladies and gentlemen, each infective is infecting fewer than one, one person after this point. Down here, each infective is infecting close to C times beta number of infections because S over N is close to one. So here, what we have is a kind of stock and flow dynamic that we can view at an aggregate level or view at an individual level. And we'll see why this individual level story is so important in understanding things in just a minute. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the role here. And we noted that in terms of these causal loop diagrams that each of these phases is associated with the dominance of a particular causal loop diagram. This first phase with infection, the second phase associated with this uh, uh, limiting the number of susceptibles, this negative feedback involving depletion of susceptibles, and this third phase with recovery, really. Okay? Um, and in fact, there's tools which people have built where you can run a system dynamics model and it will highlight which of the loops are most active or dominant at this point. So you can run your model, you can have the feedback loops within it, and you can make them glow according to how active they are, how much they're driving the overall behavior, which is interesting. Okay, so we've been talking here, folks, about a closed population, a population where the epidemic occurs at such a quick time scale, we don't have to worry that people are coming in or leaving, that those changes to population are very small compared to the, the scale at which people are getting infected. Now, we're going to talk about infection dynamics in an open population. So what I'd like to ask you here is, um, how and why would introduction of birth and death, or immigration, say, affect system behavior? And I'd ask you, just for simplicity, to imagine a situation where we still have a fixed population. So we don't have to worry the population is also growing, so there's more people overall, and so 50% of the population is actually um, it's a larger and larger quantity of people over time. Instead, imagine a situation where births equals deaths. There's turnover of people in the population. And that all babies are born susceptible, so there's no vertical transmission. So what I'd like to ask is, how would this change the behavior that we saw? First of all, how would this change long-term behavior? OK. And why would you see cyclical things? That's true. Good. Good. The story we saw here, folks, is that an epidemic is self-limiting in a closed population. It's like a fire that has a fixed amount of fuel. Safely in your fireplace, 
start it up, as long as none of those, those uh, sparks get out into an external area with nor fuel, it will eventually burn out. Right? And so we saw it was self-limiting. The nature of the process is such that it burns up its fuel, and its fuel can be viewed as what? What are sort of the fuels for an epidemic? It is susceptibles, and, and so it's going to go out after a while, and just like in your fireplace, there's going to be some residual bits of wood remaining, or re residual bits of charcoal that could have burnt up more fully, what have you. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the difference here. Now we have susceptibles coming in. If susceptibles coming in. So let me ask this. Will the infection go extinct necessarily in this case? No. No, it won't. Okay. So um, here's another question. That's a big difference. Under what conditions would the stock of susceptibles now be declining? The stock, ladies and gentlemen, of susceptibles I'm talking about. Under what conditions will that be declining? When we ask about a stock, when was it declining before? When was the stock of susceptibles declining in what we just saw? Mm. When our number of infections was, in fact, when there are infections going on, that stock is going to be declining, right? Okay, now, for this, under, under this situation with an open population, under what conditions will it decline? When? Okay, so if babies are born, is it going to increase or decrease the number of susceptibles? It's going to increase it. So it's going to, I think she may have been answering when it's, a, it's when is it going to be rising is, is when that, when is it going to be declining? What, under what situations will the stock decline? When what is greater than what? When the Outflow is greater than the inflow, right? So if we consider susceptibles in this open population situation where we have, whoa, um, let me see if I can, oh man, um, here, what, an open population where people are coming in here, under what conditions will S be declining? When the incidence is greater than the, than the immigration, under what conditions will it be rising? when the immigration or, or births into it is greater than the, the infections, right? Okay, and, and Molly's absolutely right. That could lead to cyclical behavior, as we'll see. And sometimes it'll be rising and sometimes it'll be falling. It'll be oscillating, actually, though in a damped way. And under what conditions would the stock of infectives be declined? The stock of infectives, folks, here. Under what conditions will that be declining? <coughs> well, that's a bit of a trick question because it's the same conditions as before, um, as long as there's, there's no births into the infectives and no immigration into infectives. It will be declining when the rate of a uh, rate of recoveries is greater than the rate of new infections in terms of people per per unit time. Um, I did forget to to mention one key point that I, I should emphasize, ladies and gentlemen. And it was a point made in the final moments of our class. And I'm, I stand here remiss. I stand here remonstrable for not having mentioned this. This behavior that we saw here, do we see that every time, for, for always from this model, this kind of epidemic and decline? In the closing moments of last class, we saw something different. And what was that? Does anyone remember? I was running a model in front of you, even as I stand here now. And, and this model exhibited a different sort of behavior. Does anyone remember it? Yes. That's right. That, that's right. So, so we, had this, um, we had this model last time, and I lowered the number of contacts small enough, and the infection just died out immediately. 
It didn't take off. And why was that? I argued that it was all part of this story. Why would it be if your contacts are too few that the infection would just die out if you were infected? Yeah, on average, you're going to recover before you can replace yourself with either even one person. Your chance of infecting someone is low enough that you can replace yourself. By that same token, ladies and gentlemen, if you come in with a with with chickenpox, this is less true now. If you had come in with chickenpox at Saskatoon Airport in the mid '70s, you wouldn't have been a giant threat because the people around you would have been immunized. People around you would have either had it themselves when they were young, or they would have been immunized against it. And the infection would be cleared eventually from your system and, and it will spread within the population as a whole. So even in this model, this first model with a closed population, we saw that there was a tipping point in terms of behavior. If, if we had too few contacts per unit time, or indeed if the data coefficient, chance of transmission due to hygiene or other measures was low enough, the infection would just peter out. That is a qualitative difference that can be achieved by interventions, by changing beta, changing C, for example, or indeed changing the duration of illness. We could accomplish through all of those things a situation where it just doesn't sustain itself. We're going to see more about that story, but I want to emphasize that is part, ladies and gentlemen, of a closed, even for a closed system. Okay, for an open system, though, we have this more textured issue. Now we have susceptibles coming in. And this is the sort of cycles we can see. They're damped, um, but we do actually see these writ large. <laughs> and I had shown some graphs last time. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk about what's going on here. And had I more time, I'd have you run this model. And I would encourage you strongly to, to try playing around with this. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. Have, add birth and dynamics to your model. But let's talk about it. Uh, can anyone tell me, interpret for me the different colors here. Um, each of these shows uh, different quantities within the model. What is blue, do you think? What is blue here? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I should have covered this up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good, at least people are looking at the slides. Maybe you should be throwing out candy or something. Um, uh, blue is susceptible, red is infective, and green is force of infection. Okay. Um, what is force of infection? Who can remind me? What is the force of infection? Okay, that's true. C times I over N times beta. And, and at an intuitive level, what does it represent? It's the what per, it's the, okay, it is very closely related to that, but it's the chance per unit time a given susceptible will get infected right now. So we talk about the force of infection, that's the chance per unit time a given susceptible is going to get infected. It's the hazard, the infection hazard at a given time. Could that, this is a slight digression, but could that be greater than one? Okay, this is something students get quite confused about, but wh when I said it, I said it's a chance per unit time. So it actually can be greater than one. It's just like having that alpha for the outflow of a stock. That can be greater than one, actually. So, so you're, you, we think of that normally as kind of the chance per unit time of leaving. But if, if I have a stock, a first order delay, with an alpha, a rate of, of outflow of two, two chance per unit time, what's my mean time in that stock? It is half of, it's, it's a half, a half a time unit. So it just means I'm really, really likely to leave you, because it's not a likelihood, it's a likely per unit time. 
So um, it is it is something that essentially is divided by the amount of time considered. So that will essentially mean it's a very fast rate of leaving, and I'd leave on average in, in half a time. So the, the, the force of infection actually is a likely per unit time. It's a hazard, it's a chance per unit time that I'll get infected. And that's the uh, green. Okay, so, so here we see the number of susceptibles dropping sharply from the initial time. And as it's dropping, the um, force of infection has been rising. And in fact, that's what's causing that drop. The number of infectives is also rising. But then we see it, the number of infectives come down, and then it rises again, and then comes down and rises again, et cetera. And the number of susceptibles goes down and then rises. So what is with these oscillations? Why do we see these oscillations? So let me ask, um, let me ask uh, for the susceptibles first. Why do you think we see this sharp decline, and then what's with this rise? What, what needs to be the case for susceptibles to be rising here? The stock of susceptibles. For that to be rising, on what conditions does the stock rise? It rises if the inflow is greater than the outflow. And what is the inflow to the stock of susceptibles in this model? It's associated with immigration or births coming in. Sort of net, um, net change uh, there. And so here, immigration and births is replenishing susceptibles. And then it goes, then here we have another mini outbreak here occurring, and this declines again. So I'd like to talk through this story. Here we see a situation that's as if we're adding fuel to the fire periodically. Well, it's add adding fuel to the fire actually on an ongoing basis. The fire will be bursting up, consuming it faster than we're adding. The amount of fuel will go down to a level where the fire is very small. We're adding more, and it bursts up again. And we get this kind of cyclic behavior. Let's talk about some of the key points here. Okay, folks, um, so at this peak in the number of infectives, once again, this is where the rate of new infections equals rate of recoveries, and where a person infects on average one person, their replacement before recovering. That's why it stays constant. They're just replacing themselves. And you'll notice here that the number of susceptibles as at that point is 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 on its way down. It's right about here. And in fact, that point is exactly the point where the infection is in balance. It's sustainable. And that point, ladies and gentlemen, will be the point where it reaches endemic equilibrium. That's the level of susceptibles, the fraction of susceptibles in the population where the system will be at endemic equilibrium. By endemic equilibrium, I mean the system will be in balance. There'll be no rise and fall in the fraction of infectives or fraction of susceptibles. It's at that point where each infective on average is only infecting one person before they recover. That will keep the number of infectives constant. And indeed, this is occurring at a point where the number of susceptibles is constant. So here, here we have this, um, this key point where it's in balance. But let me ask that. Why is it that the number of susceptibles is still declining after that point? If after all, at this point here, this blue, this point where the blue is just over this gray line, if that's the point where a number of, uh, where each person's infected got average one person, where the number of new infections equals the number of recoveries or the per per unit time, why is it that the number that this um, number of susceptibles drops after that point? Why is it still dropping? Hmm? susceptibles is still going to be going down because the number of infections occurring per unit time is exceeding the, the rate at which babies are coming in or new immigrants are coming in. So it's going to continue dropping. 
and it's going to drop to the point, the number of susceptibles, as the number of susceptibles is dropping, what else has got to drop? The efficiency of infection, right? And because of that, you're going to get more and more of an imbalance. Remember, folks, it was at this peak right here that the number of new infections equaled the number of new recoveries per unit, in both cases per unit time. In other words, where each person infected on average, one person to replace them. As the number of susceptibles drops further, each person is going to be infecting fewer than one person to replace themselves. So number of, the number of infect, uh, infective individuals here is going to be dropping. It's that same drop off we saw before, and a lot of people are going to be recovering. So the number of infectives is going to drop below the equilibrium value that it's going to be reaching. It's going to drop below, after this point where the system would be at equilibrium, it's going to continue to drop, and it's going to drop. And as that happens, eventually it drops to a low enough level that the, that the number of infections occurring per unit time is less than the number of new immigrants or number of babies being born. And at that point, the number of susceptibles is going to be rising because the inflow is greater than the outflow. So the number of, a number of susceptibles is then going to rise up to unsustainable levels. It's going to rise up to these levels where now the infection can be efficient again. It's, it's rising up to that level because there's very, very few infectives around as of yet. And and the number of infectives will then start to go up. It'll start to rise. And eventually, it'll rise to enough point that it pulls down this number of susceptibles once again. OK, so you'll notice that it goes to this endemic equilibrium where it's at this sustainable level. In other words, it's at this level where it's in balance, where the number of, the number of people getting infected per day, say, is the same as the number of recoveries per day where each infective infects one person before recovering, and where the number of, of new susceptibles coming in equals the number of, of susceptibles flowing out due to infection. Okay, so <clears throat> here, um, here we have this rise occurring because infectives are so low that in, in this area that Basically, births is greater than infections plus any deaths. So S rises above that level because infectives are still in decline to that point. I mean, infectives are in decline as long as the number of recoveries is greater than the number of new infections. Um, so infections, infectives remain low for a while, and that allows this to kind of overshoot its sustainable value, and that sets the, the phase for another outbreak. That sets the phase for another sort of uh, sudden increase in the number of, of infections occurring. Um, and these delays have, have key roles to play. So for a while after infectives start declining, in other words, after our susceptibles are below sustainable values, they're still depleting susceptibles. It was exactly the point made um, earlier so well. For a while after susceptibles are rising, until the susceptibles equals the endemic value, the infectives will still be declining. Until that number of susceptibles rises up to the point where it's reached its endemic value, its, its value where the number of, the number there where each infective infects exactly one person to replace themselves, at least one person, or where the number of infections equals the number of recoveries per day. Until it reaches that point, the number of infectives is still going to be declining. So this thing is going to be, is going to be replenishing itself for a while until, you know, until it reaches that key point. And after that, the number of infection, infectives is going to start to rise. But it's going to be able to get all the way up to this point kind of for free while the number of infectives is still depleted. So, so these delays are absolutely key. And for a while after infectives start rising, the births is, um, is going to be greater than the number of infections, so susceptible will still be rising. 
So we see these sort of delays. And ladies and gentlemen, one of the points I made is when you couple a feedback with a delay, particularly a negative feedback with a delay, a negative feedback such as involving um, infections on the one hand and susceptibles, with that negative feedback there, the more susceptible, the more infections, fewer susceptibles. If you combine that with a delay, what do you get when you combine a negative feedback with a delay? Remember from the causal loop lecture? You get oscillations. This is an oscillation. <coughs> this is the oscillation we get. And these oscillations lie behind at a root many of those oscillations we saw in the public health data last time. Um, but here, we have a very different situation than with the closed population. Here, we approach an endemic equilibrium, where the infection stays circulating, but it's in a sort of balance. There's no sudden outbreaks because, well, why aren't there any sudden outbreaks? So, suppose we're in an endemic equilibrium where, um, you know, there's a uh, quite a large amount, say, uh, we have uh, an infection at modest levels within our population, and someone new comes into the population. Why won't there be an outbreak? That infection has remained there for a long time. Why won't there be an outbreak? What, at least what discourages there being an outbreak? What lowers the chance of an outbreak? Because that person will be surrounded by people that are, that have already had it, or, or have it now, and so they're just not going to find lots of fuel around them to spread it to. Okay, um, so these endemic equilibriums can exist where it's in a kind of balance. Now, what we're going to see with agent-based modeling is the story is much more complex. You can, in fact, have outbreaks if infection goes into areas of the population that are, for example what they call core groups, groups with really high dense number of connections. So it may be that on average, people have very, very, you know, have one or two sexual partners during the year, but there may be some individuals who are, who have dozens. And once an infection gets into a special area of the network where there's lots and lots of contact, that's when it can spread suddenly. That's when it's sort of out of balance. Um, so here we can get in a situation where, the, where we have a balance where simultaneously um, the rate of new infections equals rate of immigration or, or, or new uh, inflows and the rate of new infections equals rate of recovery. Um, and uh, for here we assume a fixed population but similar properties will hold for a whole population if you look at the fraction susceptible, fraction infected, etc. Okay, now uh, I had a little example here that we won't uh, have a chance to get to, but if we set the transmission rate to a low enough value here as well, just as was mentioned earlier, we could get die out of infection. Infection won't be, won't remain um, efficient within this population. Even with the new inflow of susceptibles, etc., if we have too inefficient a uh, route of transmission, there's too small a chance of, of, uh, of transmission given a contact, or there's too few contacts, or the duration of illness is short enough, we can have die out of infection. Let me ask that though. Riddle me this. Why is it the duration of illness is, in fact, it is important? Why, why is duration of illness in, important in governing whether or not the, the infection is going to be able to catch hold of the Yeah, so look, if, 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 I, if I keep Im infected with influenza in a infective fashion, an infectious fashion, for two weeks instead of one, there's a greater chance than, compared to the case where I clear it in one week, there's a greater chance if I have it for two weeks as an infectious individual that I'll infect at least one person before I recover, right? I'll, I'll probably infect more people, and therefore, it's more likely to outbreak. And by contrast, if we can nip it in the bud, if we could treat someone with chlamydia or gonorrhea, or we could treat someone who has uh, a case of uh, chickenpox or what have you very quickly, 
they'll see fewer people and therefore they'll be less likely to transmit it and that baby or that individual will be less likely to replace themselves by at least one other person and therefore it's more likely we can get into the state where it just dies down. So there's these, there's again these tipping points of the same sort we saw with the closed population in the closing minutes last time. Um, so, um, so if we have a situation where the infection is too too non-competitive and it isn't efficient enough, it, all, it, it will die out in the population. Now, okay, I should say here, excuse me, now we're talking about for a closed population, in short, the infection always dies out eventually. It's just like the fire in your fireplace. It burns up enough fuel to, to not be able to go efficiently and dies out. Some infections will take longer to die out. And there's a tipping point between the two cases. Um, and uh, in this case, in the case of an open population, by contrast, the infection may stay current or it could die out. And in fact, I have a, um, a situation where, or I have a, a table here. Oh boy, where is it? Um, man, I had a really nice um, uh, summary of this, but um, maybe it'll come in a later slide. Okay, so um, I'd like now to, to talk about some um, some of these quantities. So let me ask this. Um, within this model, a given infective infects people C times S divided by N times beta, others per unit time. Okay? We derived that earlier by doing a, a rearrangement. Um, so, so there you have a contact with C people per unit time. S over N of those people are subject to infection. And for each of those people subject to infection, each of those C times S over M people per unit time that they're going to meet that are susceptible, beta is the chance of transmission. Okay? So here's the question. If the mean time a person is infected is mu, they're infected for a duration of mu, time units, how many people does that infective infect before recovery? Let's assume that number of susceptibles isn't changing. Um, that it's, it's large enough, essentially, it's not changing because of this person's effects. How many people will they infect before recovery? So if they're infecting this many per time unit, how many, how many people will they infect per unit time? This is not a trick question. Yeah, you just multiply by it. This per unit time, you make 10 bucks an hour, you work six hours, make 60 bucks. Okay. Um, okay. Um, with the same assumption, how many people would that infective infect if everyone else is susceptible? So if everyone else in the population is susceptible, then S essentially equals N. And so they're going to infect how many people before they recover? Not a trick question either. Z times beta times mu. And that's right. And under what conditions will there be more infectious people in the total population after their recovery than before their recovery? As long as what? Under what conditions will they leave the world the worst place? In other words, with more infectious people after the recovery than before. Under what conditions? If more than one person. So if surround if they're if they're dealing with a situation where they're surrounded by totally susceptible people, if what? If what is greater than what? If C times is greater than one. And if it's less than one, then they're not on average going to replace even cells with one person, then the infection is going to be dying down, right? Um, okay. So we just discovered the quanti two famous epidemiological quantities. Congratulations. Um, now I should really be throwing out candy. Um, or, or granola bars, maybe. Um, uh, uh, so the two quantities are effective reproductive number and basic reproductive number. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about these. The effective reproductive number is the number of, uh, of individuals infected by an index infected. We consider a particular sort of isolated or uh, a particular infective, a distinguished infective over the course of their illness. 
and we ask how many people would they be infected, would they be infecting over the course of their illness. Now this depends on how many susceptible people there are around them, the fraction of those people around them that are susceptible, how frequently they contact people, the likelihood of transmission, and the length of time they're infected. And if this is greater than one, then the number of people with infection is going to be rising. If it's less than one, it will be falling. Okay. Um, the basic reproductive number is just like that effective reproductive number, but it's for a very particular <coughs> case, a very, very particular context, a very particular situation. It's a situation where basically everyone around them is susceptible. Okay. All the people around them are susceptible. Here, it's the same criteria, except the fraction of susceptibles is guaranteed to be one. So this is the situation where Molly pointed out that you have C times beta times mu is the number of people they infect. And if this is greater than one, they're going to replace themselves with more than one person, and the epidemic will be rising. If it's less than one, it will be, it'll be going down. Um, now it turns out that this basic reproductive number is really important. Because if we're dealing with a situation where it's not in the middle of an outbreak, and we're dealing with a situation where basically everyone is susceptible in a population, we really care about, let's say to Ebola, we're all susceptible to Ebola. When we're thinking about from a public health standpoint, we want a health system that, that is on the ball enough, can treat people quickly enough, can lower the the risk of infection transmission well enough, can isolate people if necessary from each other well enough that R0 will be less than one, that, that this basic reproductive number will be less than one, the epidemic can die out. So if someone with you know, TB comes into the, um, into the airport, or someone with Ebola, or someone with dengue fever, well not dengue fever, that's not a great example because it's spread by mosquitoes, but um, uh, some other uh, contagious bug, um, uh, syphilis comes in. Um, we would like our healthcare system to be such that we can guarantee that R0 is less than 1, that this basic reproductive number called R0 or R0, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on um, in, your, in your training, th then uh, if it's less than 1, it will die out. If it's greater than 1, we have an unstable situation. One person could infect 2, could infect 4, could infect 8, and so on. If it's less than one, on average, I won't even replace myself, and maybe I'll infect one person, but they probably won't replace themselves, and it will, it will die out quickly. It will peter out if it infects anyone at all. Turns out it also affects the speed of the spread, how quickly it rises. So when we look back here, and excuse me for, um, for showing it, but when we look back and we saw sort of how quickly this this uh, red curve came up. It turns out it rises exponentially initially as one goes to two, goes to four, goes to eight. It, it's rising exponentially. And the speed of that rise is related to this basic reproductive number. If I infected three people on average before I recover, it would go from one person infected then after I recovered or died then it'll be three, and after I've recovered, if those, that generation's recovered or died, it'll be nine, and then 27. And so the speed of it is related very closely to this issue of how quickly do you, you, you recover, or do you um, meet people. And this D is sort of the duration of infection. Turns out that it's also related to the endemic rate. How many people stay as, uh, stay infected in this endemic equilibrium here the fraction of the population that remains, um, remains infected. Okay. Um, okay, so these are the basic reproductive number. So here, the effective reproductive number is less than one. The number of infectives is going to go down. If it's greater than one, it's going to be rising. R0, if it's greater than one, an infection introduced from outside will cause an outbreak. If it's less than one, we have a herd immunity situation. We have a situation where an infection introduced from the outside will die out. It will peter out. It won't, it won't stay uh, in, a, in a sustainable way, in a persistent way. Um, and this is what we try to achieve by quicker time to treatment, 
In other words, shorter infection time, lower lower C, lower beta. Um, okay. Um, right. So so we talked about uh, some of these equilibria. I'm going to go into this less. Um, what's the role of vaccination here? Well, it's very easy to incorporate a vaccinated stock in the models. In other versions of this class, we do this. Um, but because of time, we're going to be getting onto agent-based modeling. We don't have time to do this. But here we could add a stock, a vaccinated stock, and that takes susceptible people who would otherwise be susceptible to illness and puts them in a separate category. Now the interesting thing is that by doing, by bringing enough people over there, you could lower the fraction of susceptibles to the point where the the infection will not take hold, where there's herd immunity, where the effective reproductive number is less than one, and the infection will die down. Okay, um, so uh, here, um, the one of the key quantities is S over N, the fraction, the fraction that's that's susceptible, and um, it turns out that uh, you can drive the fact that uh, if, if we have a situation where, um, uh, where contact patterns and infection duration remain unchanged, then the mean number of individuals infected by an infective over the course of their infection is F times R0. In other words, if, if R0 is the number of people they'll affect in a, in a situation where everyone is susceptible around them, then if we consider a situation where fewer people are susceptible around them, and the contact patterns infection duration stay the same, then um, the, the number of people that in fact will be S over N, the fraction of people around them that are susceptible times R naught. And so at equilibrium, we have S time divided by N times R naught equal one. In other words, the number of people that a given infective recover that infects will be one at endemic equilibrium, okay? And this allows us to actually calculate the fraction that remains susceptible at uh, endemic equilibrium by knowing that this times that is equal to one. We could simply d say S divided by N equals one over R naught. Um, so in other words, at e endemic equilibrium, the fraction that is susceptible is one over the, um, the, the basic reproductive number. So the higher the R naught, the more, the more quickly the infection spreads, the lower the fraction of susceptibles in equilibrium, the lower the fraction that, that remains susceptible. Now, what this comes down to is this notion of critical immunization threshold. And I walk through the reasoning for this in the slides. We don't have time to go over it in detail here. But um, the idea here is that we want to achieve a level of immunization such that even if an index infectives arise in a worst case situation where no one else in the, in the, in the population is either infected or recovered from illness, they're all either susceptible or vaccinated, we still want the, the uh, effective reproductive number to be less than one. We still want that situation where just based on the vaccination programs, we can make the population as a whole resistant to infection. So the goal here is to keep the fraction of susceptibles low enough that infection cannot establish itself, even in this case. Um, and in that case, we say it exhibits herd immunity. And uh, the mathematics of it um, are this. We have this um, uh, fraction, uh, critical fraction immunized to stop infection. And so we're, we're assuming the population is divided into two categories. The fraction that are, that are susceptible, F, and then the remainder being this, <coughs> this fraction that are immunized. So we're assuming that everyone's either immunized or susceptible. It's kind of a worst case sort of situation. And we want, we want the number of people that are infected by a given individual, F times R naught, to be less than one. We want that, that effective reproductive number to be less than one. And therefore you need, it turns out, so that means F is just one minus Q sub C, the fraction that are immunized. So you can solve for Q sub C. And what you realize is Q sub C, the fraction that need to be immunized to protect against this infection in this worst case where someone comes into a population where you have 
uh, a bunch of vaccinated people and everyone else is susceptible to the infection, it's, it's got to be above 1 minus 1 over R0. So if we have an R0 of, say, something like 3, which is a little bit more than what was estimated for pandemic flu, then what we would need is a fraction that are, that are um, vaccinated of 1 minus 1 over 3, or about 66% vaccinated. Uh, if you have a really nasty infection that is an R0 of 20, which is, by the way, a function of the healthcare system as much as it is of the, uh, of the bug, but if you have an R0 of 20, which might be a really bad sort of measles type of situation, um, then you need a fraction that's vaccinated of what? If you have R0 of 20, you need a fraction vaccinated of 95%. And these are the sort of guidelines that are used for vaccination to judge you know, what fraction you're looking for. So to, to protect against something like measles, you might need for 95%, just so that you're sure that even if someone were to come in, no one else has ever gotten it in their lives. There's just the vaccinated people to protect. We have that sufficient buffer of people around us who are not susceptible, around that infected who are not susceptible to protect so there won't be an outbreak. And if R0 is equal to 4, then you have 75%. So that's how uh, immunization works. So in short, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we'll close this lecture and start talking about Asian-based modeling. Um, here we have a distinction between the case of an open population and a closed population. Closed, I mean, there's no one coming in. We're dealing with a population um, where essentially the time scales are such that we don't have people coming in through immigration or through... Um, or through birth versus an open population. In here, with a closed population, if R0 is less than one, then an epidemic will not occur. If you introduce a new infective, it remains resistant. Um, you, it's like dropping a match in a set of ashes. Bit of wood scattered around, it's just not gonna catch. If R0 is greater than one in a closed population, there will be an epidemic. But the steady state, it's going to go to a situation where it'll die out again. No one stays infected. Now, there's going to be some residual amount of susceptibles. It's going to be greater than zero. Not everyone's going to get infected before it goes out. Not all that wood is probably going to be burnt in your fireplace. But, um, and, and those individuals are going to, going to remain there. By contrast, an open population, if you have R0 less than 1, once again, if you can achieve that level of quickness in responding that you could treat people fast enough, or if you can achieve that, that uh, shutting down of schools to prevent contact quickly enough, or if you could uh, have good enough hygiene practices within the population, the epidemic won't occur. And you'll have a fraction that remain uninfected close to 1. These, these will include vaccinated people if you're dealing with vaccination. By contrast, if you have an open population where R0 is greater than 1, it's in this unstable situation. The epidemic can occur, and in the steady state, in the final state, the fraction infected will be such that the infection rate equals the recovery rate, and the fraction susceptible will be 1 over R0 for that, for that calculation we did. That's, it's at that point that, that you're going to have me, if I'm surrounded, the people around me, only one of are not of them are, me, uh, are, are, are susceptible, then I'm going to infect, on average, one person before I recover. Otherwise, it'd be infected are not people. But if only, if I normally infect 20 people with my nasty, nasty measles, and but then only one out of 20 people around me are susceptible, then I might infect just one person before recovering on average. And it's that that leads to this sort of steady state situation. So here we can have it remain endemic within the population and circulating, okay? Um, right. Um, okay, so I had some more, more comments on that um, and I'll, I'll keep these things uh, in there. And, and there's some great sort of uh, wonderful little models you can look at um, associated with that. 
But um, any questions about that before I go on and just have some preliminary remarks on agent-based modeling and uh, simulation of a, of a system with agent-based modeling? Okay. Um, I do have one brain teaser to ask you right now, which is going to go directly into our, to the first little agent-based modeling exercise. So the brain teaser is this. So if I have my little model um, uh, here of the sort we've been using, the sort of model, say, say without a vaccinated stock even. If I were to, if I were to double the length of time that someone remains infected, so I remain infected instead of for one week with flu for two weeks. Actually, it's so much shorter than that. But but imagine that. that so I remain twice as infected. How will that affect the num total number of people that I infect? If we assume a large population around me, I'm going to infect more people by approximately a, a factor of two. And in fact, it's going to double the speed at which the infection is transmitted. Because now it's going from one, I'm not just infecting you know, four people before I recover, but eight people um, before I recover. And, and each of those eight, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit to say that it's, um, uh, okay, I've got to be careful about that. I don't know if it's going to double the speed of it, but it's going to, it's going to really increase the number of people infected. So what I'm going to do now is, how many people in here have any logic installed? I sent some information um, on any logic. Okay, um, I'd like all of you to to install it um, so that you're sure to go with it uh, for our next class. Okay, but um, I'm just going to call this up, and uh, I had it up here, um, but I had to reboot. So let me let me just uh, go down here and. Um, this is going to be uh, any logic six uh, university, and um, we're going to run a, a, a different sort of, of uh, scenario, a scenario that involves um, infection once again, an infectious spread, but it's going to involve people within a particular context that's captured by the agents. So with agent-based modeling, in contrast to the aggregate modeling that we saw earlier. Um, we, we're going to have a situation where the population is organized into individuals, and those individuals will have characteristics, and that's the data associated with each of those units of organization. And those individuals here will be associated with a position, a location in space. And that location will um, be important because that will, that will govern to from whom they can affect it turns out that they'll only be able to get into from neighbors within space. Okay. Um, so apparently this thing is restoring my, my workspace. Okay. Um, so it wasn't able to get that fine. Um, so um, I'm going to have a, a video where I'm going to um, uh, play this out more, this particular example. But um, we're going to go with the sample models within any logic here. It's going to be a sample model called uh, SIR agent base. And um, uh, it is in these these examples here. Okay, so um, uh, it's in the all models uh, case. Excuse me. Um, so it's under healthcare here, um, and there it is. Okay, SIR. Um, oh gosh. Um, okay, fine. So we're gonna have to um, think load it in directly. Um, they change the location of these um, between different versions of this. So, um, okay, I think we may have to do it this way. Uh, SIR, here we go. SIR agent based. Oh. Okay, so with SIR agent based, we're going to have a set of agents, and in this case, we're going to have 250,000 agents. Okay, um, and um, these agents are just like the model we saw, they're going to be distinguished by having susceptible infectious and recovered states, but each of those agents is going to be simulated as an individual. 
And the agents are moreover going to be placed within a grid. And I'm just going to run this thing here um, so that you could see what this grid looks like. I'm going to do a small experiment. Um, okay, so here is a situation where we have a where we have a uh, lattice of agents. And there's actually, in fact, that is affected somewhere down here. And there's infection spreading out. The infection status of individuals is indicated by their color. You can see it there. Here we have susceptible individuals, infected individuals in red, and recovered individuals in gray. Okay? And the infection is spreading out as each neighbor sends it to its neighbors in north, south, east, west. Within this, within this grid. There's irregularities because in contrast to system dynamics modeling, there's only a likelihood that someone else next to me will be infected per unit of time. And it's actually simulating the, um, the chains over, over time. So this is one particular realization of many. The, the vagaries of who actually is infected and at what time they're infected depends on the roles of the dice pseudo-random number generator. So we have this infection spreading out here within this, uh, within this population. And uh, in this case, it is as it can. And it will take a certain amount of time to go. So let me ask this, folks. Um, um, here, what we see is a population that's entirely susceptible. Population is infected entirely, with the exception of a few individuals here, entirely recovered. Individuals with a certain chance per unit of time of, of recovery. So here, this is this could be th the stock of recovered, the stock of susceptibles, and the stock of infectives being here on the periphery. So I'd like to ask this: Suppose we were in this model to time how long it takes to get to the edge, and then suppose okay. So oh, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, Appreciate that. Let me let me just go switch. Um, thank you for the uh, reminder here. I'm just going to go switch to any logic here. Um, so I'm going to do share there. Okay, um, you should see any logic in just a moment here. And what I'm going to do is um, is go take a look at this recovery transition here. And you'll notice that there's this. Uh, rate of recovery. It's a rate of 1 divided by the average illness duration. Does anyone recognize where that comes from? This is a rate. It's a chance per unit time of recovery. Why is it 1 over the duration? Where have we seen that before? Where your chance per unit time is related to 1 over the duration. Where did we see it? We even discussed it within this very session of the class. Mm, probability of leaving a stock in a first order delay. You can either phrase it as a chance per unit time or, or you can deal with it in terms of a duration. If, it's, if you deal with it in terms of a duration, the chance per unit time is one over that duration and vice versa. So here it's the same issue. We have sort of at an individual level a probability that they remain infectious and they have a certain chance per unit time of one over the average illness duration of becoming recovered. So the probability they remain infectious declines in that same sort of first order decay sort of way, first order delay sort of way, it declines quickly. But let's suppose that I were to double this. So folks, what this is saying is this dot get main dot, it's basically saying, okay, it's delegating the duration of time to the main class um, over here. Now, as we'll see, if we go, if we were to open the main class, um, the main class has within it a set of parameters, and one of them is this average illness duration. <coughs> and because it's a so called parameter, what we can do is actually tell it when we create main what to assume for that. So right now we have a simulation. I'm going to create a new simulation, um, a new experiment, excuse me, and it's going to be called slow recovery. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we consider from our previous model the effect
effect of, of a longer duration illness that approximately doubles the number of people that will be infected by a given individual over the course of their illness. Now we're going to we're going to double the duration um, duration of, of illness. To do that, we've just added this experiment. I'm going to go to parameters, and I'm going to so that's the properties window for this experiment. We go to parameters here, and I'm going to increase the average illness duration to 30. Um, and uh, we, we've increased it from 15 to 30. Now I'm going to run that. What do you think the effects, ladies and gentlemen, are going to be on those dynamics for this model? The big red band is a little thicker. Okay, it's going to be thicker. Do you think each of those individuals who's getting affected is going to infect twice as many people before they recover? Is that still going to be true? No. And why not? Yeah, so they're only sending it to their neighbors. There's some difference, um, but it's pretty limited. It's going to be uh, limited in terms of sort of the width of the infection, but not, not the number of people. That, um, okay, so um, I think the God is quite interesting. Um, uh, a situation where the uh, didn't catch hold. So let me let me actually stop this and, and, and start again. We have an average infectious um, time of infectiousness. Um, and I'll double this, um, this solution here. Well, I notice that it's running low on memory if there's an issue that's fearing with that too. Now we have two x it's it looks low. Ah, here we go. Okay. So here it is. And it's a little bit too small. To you notice that this is almost all red, indicating that they're staying, they're staying infectious for a longer time. I'm not sure what's going on with the machines. Uh, very, very small. Was running thing? I think so. Um, but let's go chain Monte Carlo simulation. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'll pause that. Um, that would have been uh, <laughs> uh, um, point to be running that. But um, this, this is, um, there's something else going on, and I'm not sure what it what it is. If it's a remote um, remote system, but uh, okay. So so the idea is that uh, it is. Uh, it is not going to be infecting twice repeat um, It is, in fact, going to uh, expand. Uh, in the way, the total number of people infected over the course of the simulation is going to be to what the um, number of individuals infected per person. And in fact, um, there's going to be very little difference in sort of the overall dynamics. I am going to. Um, I, I'm suspecting that this is is due to the, this memory constraint. Now, why this is a problem for this particular model, but I'm wondering if it's garbage collecting an, an inordinate fraction of the time, something along those lines. Um, okay, so, so this seems to be a somewhat happier camper, okay. Um, uh, yes, okay, there we go. Um, so what we see is a thicker boundary, um, and we see a situation where it's spreading out. Um, uh, in much the same way as it did before. The total, as I say, the total number of people infected by the simulation end will be about the same, the entire population. Each person within this boundary is going to affect really no more persons than they did originally. Um, roughly, it's going to be between one and four, depending on the mathematics of it. Um, so, really, this is a situation where the simulation model we used in Vence is a poor approximation to this. It's a poor approximation because it assumed random mixing, that the people that surround me uh, are not particularly distinguished or are not particularly um, structured, that I mix with just about any whole population. Here we have very local communication to our neighbors and, and that really limits how much the duration of my illness, among other things, affects things. I'm just going to um, enjoy one other um, little experiment here which is um, in, the, in the closing few minutes. What we're going to do here um, to whet our appetite a little bit is to actually add a decay back from recovered to susceptible. So I'd like to ask this. If I had, um, uh, if I had done that in the other model, in the Vensa model, 
in the system dynamics model, the aggregate model, what would have happened if I had people now going from recovered back to susceptible? Well, let's do it. Um, so this is what I saw last time. Here's the number of infective. Okay, you folks um, remotely. I'm just, I'm just going to um, vend some. I'm not going to switch back because of limited time here. But uh, here we have infectives, and um, I'm going to uh, just consider this default alternative. And we're going to see, okay, um, we, have, we have some number of infectives over time. And now I'm going to add a flow from recovered individuals back to susceptible. Um, and uh, this is going to be ugly as sin. Um, but uh, this is going to be waning of immunity. Um, and I'm going to drag it down so it's not, uh, hey, come on. Um, uh, okay, boom. Um, and so all I'm doing is, folks, I'm adding into the Venza model a representative, uh, representation of waning of immunity. And I'm going to have a mean time to, uh, to loss of immunity of, say, um, mean time to lose of 25, uh, 25 days, okay? Uh, excuse me, 25 months. So mean time to lose immunity is 25. And then waning of immunity, um, the number of people who are losing their immunity per unit time is just the number of recovered individuals divided by the mean time to lose immunity. Boom. Um, and then it's just got to make sure that this um, includes that. Okay, so we're fine. So now we can have baseline uh, run of this model, baseline with waning of immunity. Um, and we're running it. And um, now what we see in the number of people infected is a situation where we have, and um, I think I'm going to, uh, to share this with the remote folks here. Um, uh, I'm going to do share entire desktop. I think that should work. Um, but for, by adding in this, this uh, flow from recovered individuals, well, I gave you a glimpse of it, but how should that affect things if you have waning of immunity? How would that affect things? Just in terms of the dynamics, before we had the rise in the fall of, of number of infected individuals, um, uh, how, would, how should this be different? So this is what we had before. If we have waning of immunity, people can now go back from recovered back to susceptible. How will this be changed? Good, good. So what Dylan said is, is here, instead of having this rise and then come down, you would have a, um, uh, a, a replenishment of the number of people who are susceptible, right? Um, and so if we go look at that, Rather than susceptibles just dropping as it did before in the, in the red, we have it dropping and then rising again because of what? Why? What's that? Yeah, because people are, his waning of immunity has come in here, and therefore this is rising. There's fewer people going out because the numbers are very low, so on balance it rises and it reaches an equilibrium. And the number of infective individuals it goes up and it and then it stays at this high level of infectious individuals ladies and gentlemen let's go see let us compute um so so here for the waning of immunity in the in the other model we're going to have a rate for going back from recovered to susceptible it's going to be called waning immunity uh, transition and the rate is going to be 1 divided by 25. Wh why that 1 divided by 25? Well, because the waning of immunity here is the rate is 1 over mean time to lose immunity. So we have recovered times 1 over <coughs> mean time to lose immunity. Um, so, uh, so here we have this rate of 1 over 25.0. Okay in this, uh, in this um, state chart. So now we're going to run this. How do you think it will affect things here, ladies and gentlemen? So in 
this model, how will it affect things? So I hear some interesting words, words that it's hard to, hard to express. Ooh. Um, I had it one over twenty five point zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Dill. I know you're watching out for me. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, one over twenty point zero, and I think this is the one I need to uh, need to share. Um, oh, oh, oh! It, it, oh gosh. Um, oh gosh. Okay. Well. Uh, they're going to have to watch the other thing. Okay, so, so now we have a, uh, a situation where we have um, waning of immunity within this model. And uh, we're going to run this thing. I think there's, maybe this goes a long way to explaining what's going on. Um, uh, okay, there's something wrong with this, uh, this software I use for the remote stuff. And maybe it's taking up time. So this is what we have in the... Um, in the uh, uh, other simulation, we have something like this. And so here, we actually have a situation where there's this kind of morass of, of infected individuals and recovered individuals within this, this broad area here. And that, that mixture is is due to what? Why do we see such a mixture of infectives and recoveds here? And, and because they're susceptible, they can then get infected again. And so that's why we see that. Okay, so now suppose in a final thing here that we are going to change this waning of immunity time instead of being 25, we're going to make it 100, or say 75. Um, so it'll be a, a bit, um, bit different. Now, how this be different? Do you think? Okay. So, anyone want to hazard a bet? This is time 40. This is time 50. This is time 75. What do you think you'll start to see here, if anything? No? Okay. Still still sort of a morass type of, of situation. So no no uh, nothing nothing too different. We just have this kind of um, whole group. Now suppose I use a a uh, timeout with time seventy five point zero. Um, so now people will recover after exactly time seventy five. What do you think will happen now? So instead of being simply an average where some people or some people less. Okay. That's, ah, now what do we see there in the center? Yeah, there's another circle, another ring, and people are getting people are getting infected there. Now, obviously, these these depend a lot on parameters, so. If this were set even longer, say to a time like 150, what you would see is, is even more pronounced. Um, you would see a, a longer time until, until that next round emerges. So here, people are staying recovered for a long time. Uh, excuse me. Are staying uh, staying infected for a very long time. So some of them are are caught up there. Okay, and now we're going to see in a few moments here. We're going to see it see the emergence of the first few people who had who, who's, um, who had developed immunity. They're going to start to lose it in the center. So it'll be just after time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, so actually, it's uh, 
Ah, okay. Now it's it's coming on more. Now, gentlemen, how would this dynamics depend on the speed of the duration of time that they carry the illness? Do you think this would look different? Do you think the patterns we see here would look somewhat different for those who, when they recover quickly? Okay, so this is this whole second wave right now getting, uh, getting infected. Right, so I've been running this on the slow recovery. If I ran it on the fast recovery, what you would see is actually vaguely similar, but it's going to be much more clear in the center. And what's the implication of that going to be? So what is going to happen here? This is with fast recovery. Right, exactly. Might not have a second outbreak. It all depends whether there's any, any individual there who's still infected. So this is with fast recovery. Fast recovery meaning there's unlikely to be these sort of trailing edges. Now here's one of them. Okay, now, now things get interesting. As that one individual starts to spread it, it remains. So ladies and gentlemen, did we see these sort of um, cycles? within the uh, system dynamics model? Do we see these spatial cycles? Do we see these waves? Did we see these kind of, even temporally, did we see the emergence of these sort of secondary outbreaks in a big way? Not really. Not really, that wasn't captured. The spatial sort of nature that, that these individuals over here are all or, or, or basically recovered, These, this is where the infectives were, and they're separated, and there's no connection. That wasn't captured by the model. Instead, the model's implicitly assuming that these people on the periphery who are infected could mix with these people down here who are susceptible. What we see here is an entirely different ball of wax. What we see here is something that, that can capture structures that are sometimes very important, structures having to do with um, geometric or spatial layout, but also structures having to do with topology, who's connected with who in networks, who's connected with who in, in irregular topologies like within facilities. So these, these sort of um, dynamics that you see here, distinguished by uh, spatial, spatial dynamics, patterns spatially, distinguished by um, sort of segregation of population grade heterogeneity and where people are, are hard to capture effectively within system dynamics models. They're hard to capture in those sort of aggregate models. And so it's for that reason, those are two good reasons why we, we turn to agent-based modeling. The sort of modeling where by capturing these things, we can both get greater insight into explaining patterns that are spatial, or do involve heterogeneity, but also where we can design interventions that, that take advantage of those factors. For example, that focus on individuals at risk at the periphery rather than individuals you know, at an arbitrary place here. That focus on individuals based on heterogeneous characteristics, et cetera. So this is an example of a, a particularly simplistic model that at a, at a high level, has the same basic structure as the system dynamics model in terms of the states individuals can be in, but because of the, the potential to introduce heterogeneity in the form of spatial distinctions, the dynamics can actually be quite different, quite different indeed. So we're going to um, talk, uh, talk about this further for the next many weeks, and indeed for almost all the remainder of the term. Our focus, well, I shouldn't say that, excuse me. Our focus will also include this. We're going to spend about probably a month and a half specifically talking about agent-based models. And then we're going to be talking about a set of processes that are in common between agent-based models, system dynamics models, and indeed discrete event models, which we'll touch on um, for a couple lectures. And um, 
those uh, discussions will be on things like calibration, parameterization, sensitivity analysis, debugging, et cetera. So we're going to be going through those in a sort of unified way that deals with multiple the modeling types. But this, um, this is going to start off our agent-based model. Now, um, I have one uh, uh, apology to make. Um, I have one final trip for the term, and it's on Tuesday. Um, so uh, no, the, no other trip scheduled, but I have a guest lecture for you, and this time it'll happen. Um, uh, so be here on Tuesday. It'll be about an agent-based model for spread of infection that's uh, a richer model. And so you'll get to hear actually a very successful term project that came out of this class in previous terms. Okay? So uh, come to that and you'll, uh, you'll see an interesting model that can answer interesting research questions. Right. Um, so I have the questions that are, are uh, for it, so I can actually release it within another day or two. So I'm uh, glad to do that. Thanks for the reminder. Is it is it next weekend or the weekend beyond that? Oh, you're right. Okay. Okay. Oh man, I thought we were one more week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah, folks, um, for those still seeking partners, this is important.